Hello and welcome to another critical care teaching video where today we are going to look at ventilator induced lung injury. So we'll talk about what ventilator induced lung injury actually means, we'll talk a little bit about oxygen toxicity and most importantly we'll talk about how we can minimise the risk to our patients. So what is ventilator induced lung injury then? Well, Think about your normal respiratory mechanics. We are all hopefully breathing by the generation of a negative intrathoracic pressure relative to atmosphere. And vasoventilation is completely different. It is a positive inspiratory pressure. It is nothing like our normal respiratory mechanics. As a result, it can do a lot of damage. One of the most obvious types of damage is volume trauma. This is excessive tidal volumes for your patient, leading to rupture of alveoli. This can cause pneumothorax or pneumomediastinum. You can get gas leaking out into the lung tissue itself, interstitial gas, and indeed subcutaneous emphysema. Often going hand in hand with volume trauma is barotrauma, excessive inspiratory pressures leading to similar problems. Then we come on to atelect trauma. This is also known as cyclical atelectasis or repeated alveolar collapse and re-expansion race. Cyclical collapsing and snapping back open, reopening of alveoli and small airways leads to shear stress and sets up inflammatory processes within the lungs that will damage the alveoli and small airways. Rio trauma is something that isn't really a massive problem for adult critical care physicians and patients, but it's been much more extensively studied in critically ill neonates and children, and this is damage caused by high gas flows within the lungs. And finally, as a consequence of the volume, the barrow, the echelet trauma, we can see biotrauma, the severe inflammatory response within the lungs as a direct result of mechanical ventilation. And we can't forget that mechanical ventilation is also stressful for the rest of the body. High positive intrathoracic pressures will impair venous return to the heart and therefore cardiac output. Impaired venous return from the head may increase intracranial pressure. Impaired venous return from the intra-abdominal circulation can lead to impaired renal and gut function. So how about oxygen toxicity then? Can we get too much of a good thing? Well, under certain circumstances, yes, that is, can, is a problem. And it's a problem for the central nervous system, directly for our lungs and for eyes as well. If we look at the central nervous system, this is known as the Paul Bert effect, a toxic effect on enzymes and cells within the CNS, which can cause visual disturbance, tinnitus, nausea, twitching, seizures, dizziness, confusion, coma. Classically not seen clinically, unless you're working in a hyperbaric environment, or you're a deep sea diver, but it's something just to be aware of. The Lorraine Smith effect, oxygen toxicity affecting the lungs, is something you may see clinically though. And this is inflammation of the airways that will spread throughout the bronchioalveolar tree into the lungs. It causes coughing, it can cause painful burning sensations on inspiration, it can cause dyspnea, and it can cause a syndrome it looks exactly like ARDS, Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome. It is known to start when patients are receiving at least 50% oxygen within a day, approximately 14 hours according to some authorities. And that occurs faster on higher concentrations of inspired oxygen. And finally, oxygen toxicity affecting the eyes. Not recognized to be a major problem for adult patients, but it absolutely is for the neonates. Retinopathy of prematurity is known to be associated with high um, inspiratory fractions of oxygen. So how do we go about minimising the risk to our patients then? Well, based on what I've said already, we should be seeking to avoid high tidal volumes, avoid high inspiratory pressures, avoid atelectasis and collapse, and avoid unnecessarily high fractions of inspired oxygen. In terms of avoiding high tidal volumes, we would usually seek to limit our tidal volume to approximately six mils per kilo ideal body weight for that patient. 
There are a lot of different equations and calculators available out there that will estimate ideal body weight. They're usually based on height, age and gender. But do be aware that you're going to get a range of different values for ideal body weight depending on which calculator you use. I plugged my own data into it and I got an ideal body weight range of anything from 75 to 88 kilos. In terms of limiting inspiratory pressures, we would usually aim to keep our plateau pressures below 30 centimetres of water. The tidal volume and inspiratory pressure targets come from an absolute landmark paper published in 2000, sometimes called the ARDSNET paper, which looked at ventilation with lower tidal volumes and lower pressures as compared with what was then traditional for people with acute lung injury and ARDS. But it may not be all about plateau pressure. The difference between the plateau pressure and PEEP is known as the driving pressure. And multiple observational studies that have looked at years worth of data on thousands of patients have found that higher driving pressures are associated with increased mortality for some patients. So again, when we're looking at pressures, we're aiming to keep our driving pressures below 14 centimetres of water. Avoiding atal ecstasis is absolutely critical if you want to prevent that repeated cyclical opening and closing of small airways and alveoli that sets up the inflammatory cascade that can lead to biotrauma. All of us right now are generating some PEEP. We do this by talking, by sighing, by coughing, usually around two to, centimetre, two to four centimetres of water. And as soon as you intubate the trachea of your patient, you remove that completely. So when you set PEEP on the ventilator, extrinsic PEEP, you should be seeking to replace what you've taken away from the patient by intubating them and a bit more to treat the disease that you're dealing with. Now there are many different ways of individualizing PEEP for your patients and we'll look at that when we talk about in, uh, initiating ventilation uh, in a different talk. But a good starting point for PEEP would be approximately 0.1 centimeters of water pressure times your actual body weight in kilos. So your 70 kilo patient should have seven centimeters of water peep. Avoiding unnecessarily high fractions of inspired oxygen requires analysis of arterial blood. And there are two things you should be looking at on that. The first is the oxygen saturation, the SAO2. Typically, most patients will be absolutely fine with a target saturation between 94 and 97 percent don't need to be aiming up to 99-100% for the vast majority of patients. And we should be aiming considerably lower in some others, such as patients with COPD who are known to run in a chronically slightly hypoxic state, or people who've had previous chemotherapy with drugs like bleomycin. In addition, we're going to look at the PaO2, uh, the partial pressure of oxygen within the arterial blood, and we would usually seek to aim for greater than 8 kilopascals in most of our patients. So today then, we've briefly looked at the different types of ventilator-induced lung injury. We've touched on the topic of oxygen toxicity, and we've looked at some of the steps that you can take to minimize the risk to your patients. If you do have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. And I hope to see you on the next video.